morning or afternoon, Abby. How are you? I'm good. It looks how are you? there already. It is. Good. <laughs> I hope everyone is well as well. I see we've got a few more people. I can't see you all, but I know you're there. That doesn't sound too creepy. <laughs> <laughs> a, little, a little bit creepy. <laughs> How are you feeling, Barbie? Better? You rested from your trip? Yeah, I think I'm finally back to normal. Good. Good. Okay, we are on half past the hour. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to join us. Good morning, good afternoon, or perhaps good evening. But wherever you are, thank you again for taking the time. Um, so this session is on um, performance management feedback. I'm Abby and I'm the PeopleOps Generalist, part of the PeopleOps team. Uh, for those of you who are watching this and are a bit new to GitLab and don't know who I am, that's who I am. Um, so um, what I would like to do, first of all, if I may, is just draw um, your attention to this issue. Um, we, in the spirit of feedback, as this is all about feedback, um, Jessica um, sent out a survey to all the managers on training um, in January. And you can go ahead and, and take a look at the responses there in a bit more detail. But there's a couple of things I'd like to mention um, on this. One is the frequency of future trainings. We're going to do them once a month. Um, we may change that to twice a month. It depends on the needs um, of you know, the business and the managers, etc. cetera, um, because we were aware that perhaps two weeks was a little bit too much, um, particularly for managers and their calendars and, and that kind of thing. Um, the other thing is that um, an interesting point, um, data point from the results there was that we need, uh, there weren't very many managers who were willing to present um, a session, which is kind of disappointing, but I would like to say that um, we in the people ops team are very happy to help you in terms of putting the content together organizing the session um, and taking care of all the kind of the back end stuff um, so don't feel that when we say would you be happy to lead a session we don't mean that you we expect you to be able to write it and do all that we're very happy to assist you um, with that and it's important that you know as a leadership team as well um, that you can provide some of your experience, your knowledge, and share it with the other managers who perhaps don't have as much experience or are new to their roles and that kind of thing. Um, and the other point is on the topics, you'll see there um, what you voted on in order of what you're interested in. And we will of course um, make sure that we're providing you with sessions and content based on um, what you've asked for. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes um, just to let you know that issue is there. Please go and take a look at it. Uh, feel free to add anything um, else to it that's missing or anything else that you want to make us aware of. We'd be very happy to, to have that. So um, moving on then to this session, which is performance management feedback, as I said, um, I just want to make a slight distinction between performance management feedback and performance review feedback, because sometimes I think they can, people might think they mean the same thing. Um, there is a, a difference. We did do a training um, a few months ago on performance review feedback. Again, we don't expect that to be it. We will revisit that and follow up on it. 
This one is more about um, giving feedback generally on performance. So kind of day-to-day -day, um, feedback, that kind of thing, in addition to the one-on-ones and other things like that. So I didn't want you to be confused and think this is about performance review feedback. It isn't. It's about how to give um, feedback and how to prepare it, when to do it, um, and that kind of thing. So there's a few points that we'd like to cover. Um, what I would say as well is I don't want to be the one doing all the talking. Um, so we really want to hear from you as managers um, on your experiences, what has worked well, not what hasn't worked well, what you've learned along the way from your um, time as managers at GitLab or in other companies where you've worked from, where you've worked at before. Um, the goal is to really make this as interactive um, as possible. And I'm really pleased that Andrew Ludigate has kindly agreed to co-present some of this with me. Um, and he's going to give share his experience of giving um, feedback um, from his time at GitLab and in the past uh, as well. So, um, if you did take a look at the uh, manager training survey issue, you would have noticed um, that one of the things that wasn't on there was feedback. Now, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of context as to why we're doing this um, session in particular. So back in October of last year, um, the PeopleOps team sent out a survey to everybody in the company. And um, you can go ahead and take a look at that in the handbook. But the things that really stood out for us um, was the comments. And in particular, there was a couple of things on feedback. Um, one of them was that employees felt that it was very task focused versus um, career development feedback. And also that there wasn't enough um, performance feedback. And I should also say that this session is the first of two. Um, Barbie will be doing a session on peer to peer feedback um, that will probably be happening in maybe later this month or early March. Um, and as it's peer to peer, it probably would make sense to open that up to everybody, um, not just managers. I think that would be a good idea. Um, so that's the background as to why um, we're doing this, because employees are saying that they're not receiving enough feedback. Um, and we wanted to explore that a bit further with all of you and um, perhaps find out a bit more about why that is and how we can help you um, with that. So um, I'd like to open this out um, at this point and ask you as managers what difficulties you've had um, with giving feedback. What have you um, encountered? Somebody wants to jump in? If not, I will ask somebody. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump, jump in. in. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. Uh, I think sometimes it's hard to find feedback when you're trying to, I think I mentioned this before, trying to balance out being supportive and encouraging with also having to give some really hard feedback that you know could hurt, you know, someone if they take it personally or, you know, if it's, if it's, you know, there's just some difficult feedback to give. And so I think that for me, I have to keep reminding myself that it's in anyone's best interest to get the feedback they need and that even though it might not seem like the nice thing to say at the time it's the thing that will help them be successful and i have to remind myself of that sometimes because it can it can be challenging to get the hard words out with you know as you're as you're beginning to get comfortable with providing feedback it, it, it takes practice to get comfortable yeah so i think bobby I think that's exactly it. I think the way that I try and do it is always start with the positives so that, you know, then it's easier to get through that you're giving some positive feedback and also some negative feedback. I think that being open and honest and transparent is one of our values. And I think um, people expect that from their management as well. So I think it's really important to do that. So giving positive feedback first and then negative to me personally is actually offending. Uh, if someone was doing that, I would say you're wrapping things up 
why don't you just tell me the negative feedback and uh, praise me when the praise needs to happen? I people, think people right. catch people catch on to it. Like if you're feeding them shit sandwiches, they're gonna they're gonna find out and they're gonna not listen to any positive feedback. Yeah, but hang on, I didn't say give a shit sandwich. I said give positive feedback if there's positive feedback to give. Yeah, and I don't. Yeah, so so what what you get is that people catch on to that format, and anytime you give them positive feedback, they're 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 tuning out because they're waiting for the negative thing, which they know will come. So I think the important thing here is to realize it's not the same thing every time and shouldn't be the same thing every time. I think that the important thing is to understand the message you want to get across in the best way that the person will receive it and be able to process it. And I think at times that's going to be going in hard with just direct corrective and um, constructive feedback. And sometimes it's going to be a combination of there's some good and there's some things to correct, but it's not always going to be the same. And I think that you have to understand that. You also understand who you're talking to and how they best receive things. Sometimes feedback is best verbally and face to face. And sometimes there's people you have to follow up with an email because if they don't read it, they're not really going to absorb it. Uh, but it's, it's, it's our jobs as managers to understand what's effective for our employees and, and, and our, and our teammates and our colleagues. And, and, uh, and I think that, uh, to assume that the right format will work in every situation or with every person is great in simplifying our roles as managers, but it's not great in being effective managers. And I think people are assuming that there's always negative feedback to give. Hopefully we're not giving negative feedback too often. Okay, I'd like to flip it and ask um, what, uh, what's happened when you've, what positive things you've encountered um, when giving feedback? What do you think um, has worked well um, when you've done it? Um, have you tailored it? Um, what's, what's worked well for you? I don't know if this is uh, super specific to the question, Abby, um, but especially within departments, um, I have found it super encouraging to see people at higher levels give feedback to um, reports that are lower. So good example is like when Sid gave me a positive you know, note on Slack um, when I was an SDR, meant a lot to me. I know Joe does that with people that are in the SDR function. Um, so I think it's important not just with direct reports uh, to their managers, but also the managers um, to managers if they're reaching out to those direct reports um, it can go a long way in terms of encouraging them to continue the motivation and momentum thanks nick yeah i'd like to add to that um having been the recipient of feedback at gitlab um what i found speaking as a recipient um is it's great when you get that was a great job but what would help me even more is to know which part um, of it of that was a great job? Was it I spoke very well or I wrote something that was really well? Um, it's good to kind of know a bit more about what it was that went really well. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that was great, but it's good to know, um, have the detail on that as well. Yeah, I agree. And I guess my feedback would be like for like more of the E-team members is even like your recruiters or like if they're doing a great job, that can go a long way. Um, if you're saying, and, and I agree with you, you should quantify it too, um, but maybe something to be mindful of too moving forward. One, one thing that, that I went through when I first started managing people is, you know, if you're res reticent or you're worried that someone's going to take negative feedback poorly, almost universally, they take it better than you expect. Like your, your anticipation of the moment is usually worse than the actual moment. Um, and you, you have to kind of go through a number of iterations or cycles to sort of get calibrated for that. But I would, I would encourage new managers to, to really just trust that, uh, for the most part, people value it, uh, and they respond, um, well for it. And so it's something, it's important not to edit yourself or to hold back, but to just sort of like push forward with it. And then people, uh, most often surprise you. You know, on carrying on Eric's theme. In my last role, um, I had the opportunity to provide 
some feedback to an employee that actually wasn't positive, but her response to me was positive. She said, thank you. She's like, in six years, no one has told me this. And from that, we were able to correct, get her into a role that she really liked. So she was, she was an employee that was unengaged, but giving her that hard feedback was really positive for her. It actually got her motivated and she was just thankful someone was honest with her. Yeah, I had someone in, that worked um, on my team when I was at Cisco and um, she was falling asleep in meetings and she was falling asleep at work and no one was giving her the feedback. They, they were all very uncomfortable to do so. Uh, and I thought that was strange. So I had to let her know that if she keeps sleeping at work, there's, there's going to be an issue and it's affecting her performance and it's affecting people's perception of her. And she did not take the feedback well. She was extremely angry at me for attacking her. I was a new manager and she, she responded very negatively. That was just a different issue. But she went to the doctor and she found out she had diabetes and she got treatment and she got well and she started staying awake at work and she, be, you know, she became a more enjoyable person to work with. And it's the kind of thing that if she hadn't gotten pressure for sleeping at work, she may not have gotten, you know, she may not have gotten the incentive to actually go and get checked out. Why am I falling asleep at work? Um, so there's, there's times you can actually really help impact someone's life too. I'm gonna, that's an amazing example, Barbie. I'm gonna do, that was a really big one. And that's like people falling asleep, people being smelly, like these hard to reach subjects. Uh, now for something really small, I noticed that many times when someone leaves their mic open, uh, which happens, I did it this morning, and someone called me out on it luckily, many times I'm the first person to speak up. So I don't understand why the rest of the company is sitting idly by letting someone kind of embarrass themselves having their, their mic open. And it's a small embarrassment, like it happens to all of us, but why aren't people speaking up? Why, why, why aren't people helping? I, try I mean, I think, go ahead, go ahead, Ben. Uh, I guess I, tr I try and help uh, when I notice it. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe it's, uh, uh, it, is an, it is an embarrassment to hop on a call uh, in the middle of somebody, uh, somebody else is doing a functional group update and there's an open mic and it can be embarrassing to, to interrupt the functional group update to scold somebody else. Um, uh, to me, this is more of maybe that that kind of thing could be solved with uh, a technical solution uh, and or and or some guidance to to try and figure out a way to get those those things solved more quickly out of band uh, instead of having to go like open up your mic to make it even worse. I'm always impressed about how quickly you detect it. I, I typically don't have the participants tab open. Is that how you see it so quickly? Well, you see, you see it like it just takes, uh, you see the active speaker. So it just takes one silence of the active speaker and you see someone else come in there. And by definition, that person has their mic open. Uh, because so otherwise they wouldn't yeah. be switched up. So you never go to minimal view. You always stay in the, you can see everyone listed. Yep. Yeah. I'm actually two extra monitors here, three monitors in total. Uh, always have all, everything open. And Ben, yeah, sometimes it's, <clears throat> sometimes you, hey, you can ping someone on Slack, you can do it in the Zoom call, but sometimes it's just easier to get it over it. And I don't think it's scolding, although maybe it sounds like that when I do it, but uh, it's, it's just reminding someone that their mic is open. And I think that person, like I was grateful that someone called me out this morning, so you reduce the impact and the longer it lasts uh, the more annoyance you've caused so i think i think you're helping you're helping someone and we should be less afraid of interrupting each other um it is in our communication guidelines i think um because we're remote it feels like a big thing to open up your mic and talk over someone that happens all the time in in-person meetings it's just because of the latency that it feels a bit more awkward please people do do, we're interrupting each other too little. And that leads to things like, we should be together more often because the interaction feels more natural. Yeah, because you, it's easier to interrupt someone. You kind of, if you're sitting across the table, it just takes a breath or something and you know someone wants to say and you can pause. We don't have that. So be a bit, be a bit more in that awkward 
moment. And thanks for also pointing out the technical things. And by the way, I think it's ridiculous in Zoom that you cannot mute someone else and that you cannot end someone else's presentation. That would be a great function and it would not get abused at all. So, but what, that, what worries me uh, about, what yeah, what worries me about introducing a technical solution for this is it's just putting a bit of paint on the problem. Um, if someone is afraid of speaking up about a small thing like, hey, your mic is open, how are they going to speak up when it's more important to speak up? And um, I've been reading a book called Crucial Conversations, which is kind of painting this really nicely. So I highly recommend this book uh, for everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know how to make people uh, understand that uh, if you don't speak up, people will assume that you agree uh, or disagree with the situation, like however the, the, the things are, uh, are going at the moment. I think you bring up a great point, Marin, and I think we should uh, reflect on this meeting, right? We were all scared to answer these questions. We were thinking about them, and it takes, it takes that moment to step up. And I think that um, all of us in this room should hold each other accountable now to beating Sid if we catch an open mic, right? A simple start thing. That's us implementing feedback quicker and tightening that loop. And then I think uh, that'll ripple down through the company uh, as we're all managers here. And going off of that, and I know Sid, you shared um, you shared that handbook communication guideline about not being afraid and being encouraged to interrupt people. And I know when I saw, or somebody shared that recently in Slack, and it made me remember and rethink about it because it is um, something that I try not to do in certain instances, and, and I need to check myself. And that being said, you know, just talking about our teams, uh, talking to our teams about that, and you know, doing so. I mean, maybe not every week, but um, encouraging it in a, in, a, in a way that is communicated well and understanding that, that that's, this is how we're going to enforce, um, not enforce, how we're going to encourage more two-way conversations or, or three-way or, you know, this, it's important to, for us to remember and us to tell our team. Um, you know, you can read the handbook and you can go back to the handbook, but sometimes in the moment you need to re be reminded. Thanks, Molly. I'll add, uh, no one that it's very hard to do, everyone can contribute if it's in monologue. That's a great way to put it. Thanks everyone. I'm glad that this is kind of, we went down this, this path, I'm really pleased. And um, please keep interrupting me. Um, I've put the content together, it's there for you, this is for you, this session is for you, this time is for you. Um, I'm just merely the mouthpiece. Um, so yeah, please, please keep, please keep jumping in. This is really great. Okay. So, um, we've already kind of talked a little bit about this already. Um, why performance feedback is important. Um, but I think we all kind of know that, you know, when we do our jobs, if you're a manager, if you're a team member, you want to know how you're doing. Um, you want a kind of rough idea or not even a rough idea, but you want to have those conversations about what's going well, what's not going well, so that you know how to perform better and do things better. And without feedback, you're blind. You don't know what's, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know how it's being perceived, you know, everything is being perceived and that kind of thing. And you may, you may reach your goal and you may do your job, but you, you're never quite sure if you don't get that feedback. So I've listed a few things here, um, but I think effective and timely feedback is a critical component of successful performance management. If effective feedback is given um, to employees on their progress towards their goals, employee performance will improve. And it's a collaborative um, effort, I think, between a manager and an employee. You're both helping one another to be better. It's not just a one-way Thing. you can give feedback to your manager as well and I know um, some of you are probably doing this with your managers some of you may not be doing it and we've talked about the whole I guess it's a confidence thing maybe or you just don't feel that there's time for it or whatever or you're just focused on, on doing your jobs um, but that's what we want we want this to be a collaborative um, effort performance is a collaborative effort um, and it helps to build trust um, and respect um, between you know the employee and manager relationship and that kind of will spread out um, 
across the company as well. Everybody will feel able that they can give feedback to one another. They don't necessarily have to be on the same team. They could be on a different team. Um, you know, we all work collaboratively together for whatever or whatever we need. Um, so people need to know it in a timely manner um, about how they're doing and what's working and what's not working and how both of you can fix it or how you can fix it um, and that kind of thing. The other thing I want to highlight is experience factors. Um, you know, we want managers to, do, to be discussing um, experience factors with their team members because their team members want to know where they are um, and how they can get to the next level. Um, and that should be happening regularly. It shouldn't just be we send people up, sends this out and um, you do it in isolation as a manager. You should be talking this through um, with your team members. They may come to you already and say, well, actually, I feel like I'm here, but I want to get to here. And then that can really help. Um, we're talking about career development and other things that we need to do more of. So I'm going to stop talking for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to pass the mic over to Andrew, who is going to um, take us through the next couple of slides on how to prepare to give <clears> feedback. <throat> Thanks, Andrew. Abby. Over to you. Cool. Um, so this handbook page is really about how to give feedback. And the, the most important points are to give feedback regularly. Um, so use your one-on-one -on -one sessions, but also set time aside for separate coaching, coaching sessions if you need to. Um, and whether the feedback is good or bad, make sure that it's timely. Um, don't wait a week for a one-to-one -to, -one to discuss something that, or to discuss something immediately, or that you could discuss immediately. Uh, always be sure to document the conversation that you've had, um, and particularly any decisions that you've arrived at. Um, and make sure to follow up on those decisions at a later stage. So review those decisions a week later or two weeks later, whatever. Um, it's also really important not to store feedback up until the time of performance reviews. Um, it shouldn't be a surprise. It, what people get in the performance reviews should be sort of a build up through the, through the quarter or the half. Um, and finally, um, it's also important to treat it as a two-way discussion and not as a monologue. So, you know, sit down and discuss the problem and come up with a solution together. Cool. Um, one one and thing, I would, if I could jump in, Andrew, one thing I would say about writing stuff down, I'm, I'm a big believer in this, like moralize, memorializing decisions. One thing that some people take it as is like, oh, we're writing it down so we can refer to it later. And while that's true, it's, at least for me, it's not the primary reason. I write stuff down because the ritual of doing that really make sure that it drives the point home. It, it increases the likelihood that it's, that it's heard and that it has some impact. It's not so much about having a record so we can assemble some big case later. It's that I find that like stopping saying like, like we just made a decision, like we just put something in the firm and we're going to write it down. Um, that increases the likelihood that it's, that it's heard and that action is sort of taken from it. I think Eric, like with the, with our one-on-ones, I think we go through like two or three rounds of, of replying to each other's things in the document before we actually get to the to the meeting so it's already evolved and and uh you know that feedback's gone through several iterations by the time we actually meet face to face cool so how should we structure fe the feedback that we give um so many of us are familiar with the team retrospective process that we use here at gitlab um, and when giving feedback to an individual um, you can use a similar framework of questions. It's basically what went well, what didn't go so well, and what can the individual learn from this, which is pretty much the same questions that you get in a retrospective, but for a team. Um, remember that the goal here is to help and not hinder. So keep the feedback factual, concise, and objective. This will really help when it comes to delivering the feedback. Um, I think it really helps to use specific examples uh, wherever possible. And uh, as always, the tricky part is delivering the negative feedback. Um, so I've got an example of some feedback that I recently gave someone. Um, so your input is always highly valued and appreciated in group calls. Um, however, sometimes your updates can come across as rambling. This is especially important to keep in mind when sharing information with executive team members or with large audiences 
as they've been looking, as they will be looking for a concise summary of the events. Uh, try to tailor the level of detail to the audience at hand. If you're nervous, prepare before the meeting and compile a summary of important points that you want to touch on and try to keep it short. Uh, the more senior people you need to communicate with, the more important this practice is. So that's some feedback that I gave to someone re uh, recently. Um, yeah, and that is the last of my slides. You're muted, Abby. I think, unless I lost my ears. I was muted. Thank you, Lee. <laughs> you beat me, Lee. I was about to speak up. <laughs> very well, people. Very well. Great. Thank you very much for interrupting, or not interrupting me, because you couldn't hear me. So, yeah, I was the only one. I could hear myself. Oh, what was I saying? Um, yeah. So, there are um, a number of feedback models out there. Um, the one that I think, and I think we, we talked about this before, was the stop, start, continue. Um, this is actually something that's in Lattice that uh, the people at team are looking at at the moment is to structure the performance review with these questions because it's not these questions, this model, because it's very simple um, to use and it's effective in one-on-ones, email or performance reviews. It's very easy um, and simple. And um, Employees answer questions about how they're doing, um, but instead of asking a long list of things, you could ask them three very straightforward questions. What should I start doing? What should I stop doing? And what should I continue doing? And then, you know, you can review that, review the answers and provide feedback. And while on the surface, these seem quite simple questions, they actually get to the heart of the information you need to evaluate performance. So the first question, um, what should I start doing, gets employees to think about what they can improve on. Is there something they should be doing that will give them better results? And you as managers can use this to suggest how employees can take on new challenges or new tasks um, to advance their careers. Sorry, I'm, my throat is very dry, I apologize. The second question helps employees think critically about their behavior. What are some things I should stop doing? Um, and things that are, gets them to check their behavior and think about things that they don't, that don't work. And that's where um, you as managers can offer constructive criticism to help employees recognize that their behaviors need to change. And the final question, what should I continue doing? Gives employees a chance to talk about their successes. What are they doing and or what have they done that's been successful? And this is a point where um, you as managers can praise them for the good work that they've done and encourage them to keep it up. And also, um, I'd add to that, that you can, um, if it's something that, let's say that can be that, uh, the knowledge perhaps that that employee has that they're doing their job or a particular task really well, that could be shared um, amongst the team. You can empower them to say, well, listen, you've done a great job with this. I know there's some other people in the team who could really benefit from you um, giving them some training or some coaching um, about how they can do this. So, um, as I say, it's very simple and easy to use. Um, and we are currently looking at this in um, Batis as well. So um, once you've gone through the process of preparing, you've written down um, some questions, you've thought about a scenario. So for example, something um, has gone really well or something hasn't gone that well and you want to give um, feedback, you've taken a step back, you've looked at it, what went well, what didn't go well, um, and you've made some notes. Now it's time um, to make some time with the person. Um, and you may want to do this outside of the one-on-one -on -one, and you can um, invite them to the meeting with an agenda, um, with some questions that you've prepared. And this will help you provide context um, and put your feedback into the stop, start, continue. And you can also check that this is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic um, and time bound, so smart 
um, if, and if needed, um, you can also practice um, delivering the feedback with one of the um, HR business partners or me or a colleague um, or even your manager. Um, and you can get, um, you can also include some bullet points that clearly illustrate um, the point that you want to make to the employee. And the more you can identify patterns and give examples, the better the employee will understand and will be able to act upon the feedback. So we talked a little bit about um, what questions um, you should ask, and I've um, made, I've added um, some of them to the page in the handbook there on point 27. I think um, what makes feedback two way is asking for feedback yourself about you and um, asking the individual, okay, well, you know, how am I doing? What do you think I need to improve on or um, change that would help you? Um, and also getting the individual to think about their own performance. And I think the more this is practiced, um, the easier and more familiar it will become. Um, so you may, the goal is to have a situation where something has happened, something bad has happened, or something hasn't gone well. I think we all know deep down when that's happened, we all have that nasty feeling of, yeah, we got through it, but it wasn't great. And yeah, I didn't do a great job. Um, I've certainly been in that position myself. And I know, yeah, and I'm already thinking, okay, that happened. What can I do better next time? So the ideal situation is that when we have these feedback sessions, I will come to Barbie and I will say to Barbie, Barbie, I know this happened. It wasn't good. This is what I think I need to do next time to make sure it doesn't happen again. And Barbie may say, yes, Abby, great, wonderful, go do it. Or Abby, no, you need, this is what needs to happen next time. And this is how we're going to do it. And I think by being prepared, um, we'll, we'll make for a more healthy and collaborative discussion rather than just off the cuff, quick, that was great, or no, that's not great. We'll talk about it at the one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and don't forget to listen to the other person's thoughts and ideas. Um, they may have a different perception than you do, which will also help you further understand how best to manage them. Um, I'd also like to highlight a section um, in the handbook called Interning for Learning that Sean McGiven proposed a couple of months ago. Um, so if you come across a situation where you think that somebody needs um, perhaps training in a certain thing that another team is able to, to give or if they need to just shadow somebody, um, this is a great way for people to take some time out and learn a new skill in a different team. Um, and I would encourage you all um, as managers to take a look at that and see if it's something that you think um, would be beneficial for anybody in your team. Your team, one of your team members may come to you um, directly about this um, anyway. But I thought I'd just highlight that um, as well if you weren't aware of it. Are there any questions, any comments um, at this point before we carry on? Yeah, I had a quick one here. I recall there was an initiative to do 360 degree feedback. Uh, we're kind of allowing us to get more feedback and I'm wondering where that sits or, or how that's going as well. Kind of off topic, but still. Yeah. So I can, I can respond to that a little bit, Lee. So when we do launch the performance feedback um, in March through Lattice, it will be 360. So you can, as a manager, ask for feedback from whoever you want, but you should definitely get it from your team. Uh, and in addition to that, it's my vision to begin rolling out with other leaders at the company, what we do at the executive team level, which is to actually give each other um, some public feedback. And we, we kind of sit around the proverbial table together and we um, share feedback in front of each other, which enables all of us to know what each of us has to work on so we can all help each other work on those things. Uh, since we're, not, we're being transparent about all of our weaknesses and strengths, not just with our, not just with Sid. Uh, and so I think that's something that other teams can benefit from as well, but we haven't really taught um you how to do effectively yet and so i think there's some work we have to do there and i would also say a great book to read that will explain the benefit of this and and talk about it some is the advantage by peter lynch and Coney. 
um, which also um, gives some information about the kind of trust you need to have for those types of settings to be successful. Awesome, thanks. Okay. Um, in the next um, slide, um, there is one uh, thing that I would like to touch on briefly, um, which is, I think sometimes when, particularly when something goes wrong and trying to understand why something went wrong, um, or if somebody's performance has taken a downward turn, you may need to dig a little deeper. And I was, Jessica um, actually provided um, this tool. It's a, called a performance issue root cause diagnostic, um, which I think, you know, when we're trying to identify root cause, it's extremely difficult to do. Um, but one of the things that might help is to perhaps use this diagnostic, which looks at these four areas around motivation, environment, knowledge, and skill. And I think for you as managers, it might help you um, to try and determine what the root cause of, a, of a, an issue is. I also think it's probably good to actually get the employee to probably do this themselves as well as to sort of get them to think about, um, you know, the situation and why something is happening. Um, I think it's a great tool. There are others um, out there as well. And if you have experience of, of a similar tool or a similar process or anything that you've come across that has been really helpful um it'll be great um to hear about that and also um use it i guess um and there because there could be complex factors affecting performance that sometimes are out of the employee's hands but that's not to say that root cause is always you can easily find it you can't and it may not be appropriate um to use it and then we have an underperformance process um in addition um, to this, but I wanted to um, share this with you now. I think root cause is something that we will explore in further detail because it, it is quite complex and it's not something that we can just talk about very quickly and then move on. Um, although I appreciate that's what I'm doing, um, but I think it was worth mentioning as we were talking about performance management and that kind of thing. Um, so, as the Harvard Business Review observes, if you want to become a great manager, you need to be a great coach. And yes, employees stand to benefit tremendously from ongoing coaching. Um, managers potentially have a lot to learn too, and it's something that we want to support you with and help you with um, as well. And remember, every single employee approaches their job differently. You never know when an employee might say something that gives their boss a eureka moment of sorts. On top of that, ongoing coaching helps managers learn to interact with a more diverse set of personalities, thereby sharpening their management skills. So to summarize, um, feedback is the cheapest, most powerful, yet most underused management tool that we have at um, our disposal. Feedback is, a powerful, as, is as powerful as it helps people get on track. It serves as a guide to assist people to know how they and others perceive their performance. And I think we all know that feedback can also be very motivating and energizing. It has a strong um, link to employee satisfaction and productivity. People like to feel involved and identified with their organization and feedback can help um, achieve that state. And that is the end of the presentation. Any questions or anything else people want to talk about? Um, Abby, I, I can just add some strength to your last points. So um, in, in parallel to this, Jessica Mitchell drove a survey of the engineering organization. And for engineering management in particular, there were two questions that, that came in strikingly below the other ones. Um, one was about career development. We have a plan to address that. The other one was specifically my manager has consistent, timely, and fair method for evaluation of individual performance. 55.6% had favorable opinions of the statement. 
37% were neutral, which you could argue is, you know, neutral is, is kind of negative on a point like this. And then 7.4% were unfavorable. So this was probably the single um, largest area of improvement for engineering management, something that we're, I'm going to talk about in our FGU on Monday, and something that I'm going to be pressing all of all the managers in my function to, to get significantly better at. Thank you, everybody. Anything else to add? Okay, I'd just like to add and say thank you um, to everybody for joining. And thank you, Andrew, for your help. And thank you, um, everybody, for jumping in on the discussion um, as well. Thank you. Thanks, Abby. That was really good.